It's a great pleasure for me to welcome our next speaker, the American Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. I think it's morning in your uh, time zone. I know you've been traveling from Hawaii, uh, where you met a high-ranking Chinese uh, official. Earlier this year, uh, I listened to your speech at the security conference uh, in, in Munich, and I enjoyed your upbeat message that the free world is winning. So we look very much forward to listening to you today. Please join me in welcoming the 70th United States Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Anders, thank you very much. Thanks for that warm greeting. It's great to be with you all today. And hello to the Copenhagen Democracy Summit. It's an honor to be with you and with Secretary General Rasmussen, a friend of freedom-loving people all across the world. Uh, I don't know if you all know this, but when it comes to strengthening transatlantic relations, Anders really walks the walk. Uh, his son and three beautiful grandchildren live here in the United States. They're United States citizens. Glad to have the Rasmussens on both sides of the Atlantic, bringing, bringing us together. Uh, thanks for having me today. When, when Andrew sent the invitation to me, I, I said yes immediately. So, so many of these conferences that, that you all participate in talk about what's wrong with the world. I wanna, I wanna focus on uh, what's going right in the world today, what we've gotten right, and that's democracy, and we know it. Uh, it's how to preserve it that is the challenge. There's no nobler goal for all of us. I, I spent a few years of my life, it's been decades when I was a young soldier serving in Germany, patrolling along the Iron Curtain. I've seen tyranny firsthand, and I have dealt with all manner of unfree regimes in my previous role as director of the CIA, and now in my current role as Secretary of State of the United States of America. First principle, there's nothing brave or visionary about oppressing your fellow men or women. Democracy is the only system of government that honors human dignity and personal freedom progress for mankind. The corollary is that capitalism is the greatest anti-poverty poverty program in all of history. I want to make a few brief remarks and I'm looking forward to taking questions. Uh, first, the idea that Europe is being forced to choose between the United States and China. I want to talk about that at some length. Second, the belief that it's costless to compromise your values. Everywhere I go, Everywhere I go, I talk to my counterparts and audience like this about the reality of what we see in the world, especially in China. Done in Europe, done in the Arctic, done in Central Asia, done in Africa, done in the Pacific Islands. For many years, the West, in an era of hope, believed we could change the Chinese Communist Party and improve the lives of the Chinese people along the way. That was the bargain. That was the bet. The rising tide of democracy in Eastern Europe and in the former Soviet Union 30 years ago made us believe, perhaps reasonably, that the spread of freedom in every nation was inevitable. And so we engaged. We opened ourselves to an authoritarian regime that we knew was hostile to democratic values. Along the way, the Chinese Communist Party made a bet. It bet that it could take advantage of our goodwill while assuring us they wanted a cooperative relationship. As Deng Xiaoping said, hide your strength and bide your time. Talked about why this has happened. It's a complicated story. Fault is not material here. It's not important. Over decades, Americans, European companies invested in China with enormous optimism. I ran a small business. We had an operation in China ourselves. We outsourced our supply chains to places like Shenzhen. We opened our education institutions to PLA affiliated students. We welcome Chinese state-backed investment in our own countries. Now we're deeply intertwined. But even so, even so, we must acknowledge a set of facts about who and what we're dealing with. And I think we're seeing this. I think all, all across the world, this is becoming more apparent each and every day. The Chinese Communist Party decreed an end to freedom in Hong Kong, violating a UN registered treaty on the rights of its citizens. One of just many international treaties that the Chinese Communist Party is violating. General Secretary Xi has greenlighted a brutal campaign of repression against Chinese Muslims, a human rights violations on a scale we have not seen 
since World War II. The PLA has escalated border tensions. We see them today in India, the world's most popular populous democracy. We watch as it militarizes the South China Sea and illegally claims more territory there, threatening vital sea lanes, a promise it broke again. But the CCP isn't just a rogue actor in its own neighborhood. If it was, we might think differently about it. It, it impacts us all. It lied about the coronavirus and it led spread to the rest of the world while pressuring the World Health Organization to assist in a cover-up campaign. By the way, a failure of transparency that continues even today. Now hundreds of thousands of people have died and the global economy is decimated. Even now, months into the pandemic, we don't have access to a live virus. We don't have access to facilities and information about patients in December in Wuhan remains unavailable. It's pushing disinformation and malicious cyber campaigns to undermine our governments, to drive a wedge between the United States and Europe, and it's saddling developing nations with debt independency. You've seen this all. Everyone in this room knows that the Chinese Communist Party strong arms nations to do business with Huawei, an arm of the CCP's surveillance state. And it's flagrantly attacking European sovereignty by buying up ports and critical infrastructure. Greece to Valencia. We must take off the golden blinders of economic ties and see that the China challenge isn't just at the gates, it's in every capital, it's in every borough, it's in every province. Every investment from a Chinese state-owned enterprise should be viewed with suspicion. Europe faces a China challenge, just as the United States does, and as just as our South American, African, uh, Middle Eastern and Asian friends do too. And I had a chance earlier this week on Monday to speak with my EU counterparts. I, I know that there's fear in Europe that the United States wants you to choose between us and China. But it's simply not the case. It's the Chinese Communist Party that's forcing this choice. The choice isn't between the United States, it's between freedom and tyranny. A party that wants to throw away the progress we in the free world have made through NATO and other institutions both formal and informal institutions, and adopt a new set of rules and norms to accommodate them is in Beijing. I don't believe that there's a uniquely European or American way to face this choice. There's also no way to straddle these alternatives without abandoning who we are. Democracies that are dependent on authoritarians are not worthy of their name. Look, I, the good news is my European friends, uh, even this week, I could see it. It's not uniform. There are different thoughts in different countries, but they're waking up to this challenge. Uh, and I heard some of them. Uh, they question whether the democratic way of life can win. Uh, and Beijing relishes this uncertainty. They shouldn't be confident. Uh, we're winning. This is what you talked about in my remarks in Munich. One CCP diplomat in France recently said, quote, some Westerners beginning to lose confidence in liberal democracy, or, end of quote. And some Western countries have become psychologically weak. But democracy isn't fragile in the way the Chinese Communist Party believes it is. Democracy is strong. We defeated fascism. We won the Cold War. It's authoritarianism that is fragile. CCP propagandists work hard to control information flows and speech to maintain their grip on power. And they won't be satisfied until the digital firewall extends to our nations too. You know, in some ways it already does. We could talk about this at some length, Andrews. And while I do not believe for a moment democracy is fragile, it does require careful stewardship and constant vigilance. I've been encouraged recently in private conversations with European allies who are taking their responsibility seriously. We had a vigorous discussion earlier this week, as I mentioned earlier, we debated what democracies ought to be engaged in. And that's what we do. That's precisely the kind of debate we should have was a good meeting and we'll continue our dialogue with the Europeans on China. Meanwhile, positive steps abound. The new interparliamentary alliance on China, substantially comprised of European leaders, is adding new members weekly. Denmark has bravely stood up to the CCP's attempts to censor Danish newspapers. The United Kingdom is moving towards securing its networks from Huawei. The Czechs are standing up to the PRC's coercive diplomacy. The Swedes have closed all of their Confucius Institutes reside on their soil, and our NATO allies have committed to increase defense spending by a cumulative $400 billion between now and 2024. 
and Andrew's successors and Andrew's successor at Brussels, General Secretary Stoltenberg, recently gave visionary remarks about the alliance's mandate to stand up for a world built on freedom and democracy and to counter China's malign influence in the Asia Pacific region. I'll end here so Anders can speak. We all know we've lived it. Democracy is not easy. It's messy. The whole world can see how we have tough debates like my country is having right now. But that struggle reflects commitment to fundamental values and our constant striving towards a more perfect union. It's who we are, and we share those values with our European friends. I hope I'll hear more public statements from Europe about China Challenge because all of our people deserve to know about it. And America is ready to stand with you. Let's speak clearly, and more importantly, let's act decisively. Let's not leave any confusion about the choice between tyranny and freedom. Anders, look forward to our conversation. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, I also appreciate your willingness to answer some uh, questions. My first question is uh, regarding uh, China. A few days ago, you met uh, with the Chinese State Councillor Yang, who is considered one of uh, the architects of China's foreign uh, policy. China's news agency, uh, Xinhua, put a positive spin on the meeting. They wrote, both sides fully elaborated on their stances, agreeing that this was a constructive dialogue, and you agreed to maintain contact and communication. When I read texts like this, uh, I might be thinking something is going on. So my question to you is, could it be that the United States and China secretly are preparing new initiatives to reduce tensions while publicly you are maintaining a tough uh, stance. And uh, one in the audience has asked uh, a question uh, on whether we could expect the US to take new initiatives vis-a-vis -vis China. So Anders, it was a, uh, a long overdue meeting. It was a long meeting. We met for some six hours or so. Each side staked out what I think for each was pretty familiar positions. Um, for, as for me, I articulated that day just exactly what I articulated here this morning. Uh, America is um, engaging in a response to Chinese Communist Party and aggression in a way that America has not done for the past 20 years. It's not political. We've had Republican presidents and Democrat presidents who, who simply allowed China to have deeply non-reciprocal relationships, not just on trade, which of course is true. Uh, but we responded to their military use, use of military force uh, by moving back. We responded to their use of diplomatic coercion by retreating. Uh, Donald Trump's not going to permit that, uh, and we made that clear. Uh, you, you referenced statements. Those are statements. What I spent a good deal of my time speaking with uh, Yang Zhixie about was the fundamental idea that we're just watching actions. It's no longer enough uh, to listen to what uh, the Chinese Communist Party is saying. We can see their actions. I ticked through a few of them. Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang, what they're doing in India, what they've done in the ec economic zones along the Philippines, Malaysian, Indonesian, Vietnam, uh, the coercion on Australia when they, had the, when they had the audacity to demand that there would be an investigation of how this virus got from Wuhan to Milan, how this virus got from Wuhan to Tehran, how this virus got from Wuhan to Oklahoma City, uh, and to... Belgium and to Spain and decimating the global economy. Look, we, we, we had to, we were, I was a very frank conversation. We still don't have the answers the medical professionals, epidemiologists need to take on this challenge. If the Chinese Communist Party can't rise to that, forget what they say. If they can't rise to that level, what every democratic nation would have done in response to a virus that began in our nation, we would have we would have participated in a global response where we shared information openly, we learned together, and we resolved the problem set together. Instead, they did what authoritarian regimes do. They disappeared doctors, they uh, squirreled information away, and they denied the world the access it needed to respond to this virus in a way that could have reduced a lot of risk and a lot of costs. Uh, that's, that's the nature of the conversation that we had. I think as America's most senior diplomat, it is always useful to be in a room together, to have a conversation, and to share the
you indicated uh, that the United States might consider to withdraw the special status uh, for uh, Hong Kong. Um, which measures could you imagine regarding trade, travel, currency exchange, um, etc.? Will Hong Kong be treated like all other Chinese cities? Well, it appears that that's China's intention. And I always... When I hear my European counterparts say, uh, well, we don't want to choose, I always remind them the other side gets to choose too. So when you ask, will Hong Kong be treated as any other Chinese city? It will be to the extent that the Chinese cho choose to treat it that way. Look, uh, I haven't seen what happened overnight, um, but the Chinese Communist Party appeared intent on passing a national security law that will deny significant amount of freedoms that the Chinese Communist Party had promised to the people of Hong Kong would last 50 years. There are a set of elections scheduled for September. We should all watch closely. That's not that far off now. We should all watch very closely where those elections are permitted to take place in a free and fair fashion. To the extent those elections are delayed, postponed, canceled, or somehow not treated in a way that is fair and open, I think that will tell us everything we need to know about the Chinese Communist Party's intentions with respect to freedom in Hong Kong. President Trump, as far as policy, President Trump's made very, very clear. Uh, to the extent that uh, Chinese Communist Party treats Hong Kong as it, as it does uh, uh, Shenzhen and Shanghai, we will treat them the same. We have many agreements that are unique between the United States and Hong Kong, separate and different from uh, those we have with uh, Beijing. Uh, we will move away from every one of those. And then second, the president's made clear too, we have a responsibility to hold accountable those inside of China who failed to live up to those agreements as well. So we are working our way through a decision-making process to determine who those decision-makers were and what the appropriate uh, mechanism is to hold them accountable. Uh, we, we, we don't want to harm the people of Hong Kong. They're the freedom-loving people that we aim to, uh, to get the benefit of the bargain they made with the United Kingdom. But to the extent the Chinese Communist Party denies that, we're responsible to hold the relevant parties accountable. But what will happen uh, if uh, the security law leads to imprisonment of democracy activists, uh, etc., uh, in the autumn? What could you imagine to do? You know, Anders, I, I just don't want to get into particular decisions. I, w I don't want to foreclose anything that the president may choose to do or not to do. We're still working our way through that process. Uh, two things to think about, though. One is, what will the people of Hong Kong do? We we've watched them. They they've simply asked for the mainland Chinese to live up to the commitments that were made. We're on year 27 of a 50-year deal. You wouldn't take that. You signed up for deal for 50 years. Somebody walks away at the halfway point. You'd you'd not be happy. Year 23, I guess it is. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the people of Hong Kong respond, and frankly, the people, the freedom-loving people in the mainland as well. They're watching too. Never forget that while we see a unitary face from the Chinese Communist Party, that that billion and a half people also have ideas that are different and uh, may well be watching how this transpires as well. I know the people of Taiwan are certainly watching how this transpires. Uh, and second, as for how the United States will respond, I'll, I, I want to leave I want to leave open the range of possibilities. But the president has made clear, uh, to the extent Hong Kong is treated by the Chinese Communist Party as just another piece of mainland China, there's no reason for the United States to treat them any differently as well. And we have a law that requires that as well. Um. You also mentioned Taiwan. I think we agree that uh, Taiwan is a beacon of democracy, a real contrast uh, with uh, mainland communist uh, China. What more do you think we could do to defend the Taiwanese democracy? And shouldn't Taiwan be allowed, for instance, to join uh, WHO uh, and maybe other international organizations? So it's widely known how hard many countries, uh, the United States, amongst them work diligently to allow the uh, Taiwanese government to participate at least as an observer as part of this most recent World Health Assembly. There's another scheduled for November. We think it both appropriate 
for them to do so. And perhaps even more importantly, very useful. And they have a great deal of knowledge. They handle this coronavirus very, very well. And they have high-end technology, high-end pharmaceutical capabilities, high-end scientists. We think it would be very useful for them to be part of the conversation that surrounds how the world is going to respond to the continued, continuing pandemic. Uh, as for how we deal with Taiwan, the United States has had a clear set of policies that extend back to, uh, the, depending where you want to start the clock, back to the early 1990s is a reasonable place to start. President Trump has adhered to those commitments uh, and will continue to do so. We, uh, they're, they're set up very clearly and we will continue to abide by them. If I may, let's turn to, to Europe. Uh, the White House has announced an intention to reduce uh, the US troop presence uh, in uh, Germany. May I ask you, uh, will a possible reduction uh, in Germany be compensated by an increase in the US presence uh, in Eastern Europe, for instance, in Poland? So as for troop deployments and numbers, I will leave that to my colleague, Secretary Esper, to, to talk about. I, I, I try to uh, maintain these, these boundaries. But as for US policy, I, I can speak to that very clearly. Uh, I've been here as a Secretary of State now for uh, just over two years. I've been part of the administration since the beginning. We set out back in uh, early 2018, um, excuse me, back in early 2017, in the spring of 2017, to evaluate our entire, the entire structure about how we uh, engage in the world. And that certainly has a component about uh, troop stationing, where we will put people, how we will deploy them. It has two dimensions, one, their location, and second, the dimension of should these be permanent bases, are we better off in a more modern world to have rotational deployments where we can get the right equipment at the right time? We always think about soldiers on the ground, much, much of modern, uh, conflict today involves things disconnected from, I was a tanker, I was an army guy, I love that dearly. I wish the whole world just revolved around M1 tanks, it make me happy, but it doesn't. Uh, it now revolves around big air forces, uh, uh, big cyber capabilities, big capabilities that are uh, in different pockets. Uh, we, we've tried to, we're, we're trying to make sure we get all of this right. So it's no longer, it's no longer reasonable just to think about, hey, do we have thousand soldiers or 5,000 soldiers or 10,000 soldiers, but what's the threat that's posed to the United States of America and our friends and allies? Uh, and how is it that we collectively can best respond? So what you saw the president announced the other day was part of that review process. Uh, it is extensive. It extends not only to Europe, but throughout the Middle East. We were thinking, you, you've seen decisions the president has made there about how it is that we can do the right things to meet the challenges of the day. And then lastly, this, this very much connects up to the topic I spoke about today. Uh, make no mistake about it. The United States does believe that it has a real responsibility to ensure that we have the capability and the capacity to challenge any threat that the Chinese Communist Party should make militarily to the United States of America. So we are constantly thinking about how we engage diplomatically, economic, and militarily to meet that challenge. So as the president thinks about Europe and the Middle East and our, our soldiers that are stationed in Africa, uh, we are ever mindful that a free and open Indo-Pacific matters to all of us, including to Europe. And we want to make sure that we have uh, allocated resources appropriately to address those concerns. I've got a question uh, from the audience. Uh, I read it. Uh, do you understand if European friends and allies see a threat to democracy generates from the U.S.? due to a slow and dangerous breakdown of state institutions and democratic principles? No. That's a clear answer. <laughs> no, I, look, I, I, 200 plus years on, we have the most, and I should be careful, because I, I tend to want to brag about the United States, uh, but. This is, this is a democracy that has withstood enormous challenges throughout its history. And our institutions have withstood enormous challenges. And as the world changes, I am confident we will still have challenges. But I know this, our founders nailed it. Our founders got it right, the principles. 
and laying down a set of God-given rights for the American people, saying that the United States government is designed and purpose to preserve those rights, has provided both a textual and a structural mechanism for democracy in the United States to survive each and every one of these challenges. Doesn't mean it happens automatically. I now, as a Secretary of State, am a steward for this very set of rights. I have a responsibility, a duty to ensure that I do everything every day to be part of furthering the capacity for our republic to continue to remain strong. But if you ask the question, um, can I understand how anyone would stare at this and think that American democracy was at risk? It's a really simple answer. Um, very often uh, we see the Chinese government use uh, divide and rule tactics uh, where they single out individual countries for punishment if they don't listen uh, to Beijing. Uh, follow the instructions from Beijing or are going against uh, Beijing. I will ask you, shouldn't uh, the world's democracies form a united front, an alliance of democracies that can stand up against the autocracies, protect each other, and promote freedom and prosperity? Anders, it's an incredibly important question. Uh, a number of thoughts, but I'll, I'll start with this. Uh, you'll recall, you said, should we create a united front? <clears throat> this, this is China's, uh, this is China's name, the United Front. This is what is in your countries, in your <laughs> United Front. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll choose just a slightly different name. <clears throat> but conceptually, you you nailed it. You, you've got it exactly right. And I think the wonderful news uh, for democracies and freedom-loving peoples is that I see that happening. Uh, I can tell you that when I met with my Chinese counterpart, he could see it happening while we were sitting in the room, while we were meeting. Uh, a statement from all G7 members came out about Hong Kong. Uh, the timing, I'd love to claim, was intentional uh, and very well thought, thought out. Uh, but the truth of the matter is we were just doing what freedom-loving peoples do, continuing to demand an ever, uh, an ever more expansive conception of freedom and forcing, as best we can, other countries to honor commitments that they've made. So your, your core point, uh, China's objective is in fact to single out and indeed to threaten to single out more, uh, more directly. It's not just European countries. Uh, we've seen them do it in the Middle East. We've seen them do it in Africa. We've seen them do it in Southeast Asia, closer to their own nation. Uh, what, what I have begun to see over my two and a half years as Secretary of State is the world awakening to this threat. Right now, many of these conversations about just what you described are happening to me privately. The calls are, hey, Mike, um, here's what we're observing. The Chinese Communist Party engaged in here. How can you help? We do our best in each case to provide them the type of assistance that makes most sense. We need to raise this to another level to where countries are prepared and are in position to respond to these things in a public way. When we do that, uh, the Chinese Communist Party will be more isolated, and I hope because my objective isn't bad things for the Chinese people. I hope that the Chinese Communist Party will begin to recognize that if they want to rise, if they want to continue um, to build out their nation, that they need to do so on a Western rule set, a rule set that honors the rule of law and honors freedom and respect for sovereignty. If they, if they can flip, if they can make that difference because the rest of the world demands that of them, just like we do of every other nation with which we interact. It's not unique, it's simply reciprocal. We, we don't ask the Chinese government to do anything we don't ask the Belgian government to do. Just honor sovereignty, engage in the rule of law, compete fairly around the world without subsidization of state-owned enterprises. If they will do those things, uh, then, uh, then I think the world will be in a better place and freedom-loving nations can be secure in their freedoms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mike, for taking time to, to talk to us. Uh, it's a very important conclusion of two days uh, Democracy Summit uh, here in uh, Copenhagen. We appreciate very much uh, your support for freedom and democracy and your dedication to American leadership. So I feel confident that my three grand American grandchildren uh, will um, be raised in a much better world. Thank you very much. Anders, thank you very much, sir. Thanks to everyone for giving me this time. So long. Thank you.